dealt with liberalism, how under liberalism, they, their, their basic error is they take away from the Word of God, and uh, little to nothing matters. They just believe grace covers all. They can live any way they want to live, any lifestyle they want to live. And once saved, always saved, and, you know, nothing really matters. They're, they're uh, rebellious. They have a little, little to no relationship with the Lord. And that's a problem under liberalism. And the Bible speaks against that. He's, he speaks against a lifestyle that is against the godliness and righteousness lifestyle that a Christian should live. And as we shared with you and gave you that list, uh, two full pages of lists that the Apostle Paul and the other apostles in the New Testament gave us as to the conduct. The works of the flesh are manifest. They show themselves. You want to pray about it, fast about it. It tells you exactly what it is that we should uh, avoid and abstain from. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we have talked about uh, the second step here, and that's uh, legalism. And legalism is, an, is, is a lot of religion, a lot of doing, uh, very little being. And uh, we shared with you that religion is do-oriented, but Christianity is be-oriented. People can do religious things. They can even do what we would consider Christian things. But that doesn't in and of itself make them a Christian. Putting on the garb does not equal being. But you know, folks, if we are a Christian then what will flow from us is Christianity. And it will affect every area of our life. But you see, the basic area of legalism is that they do in order to be. That if I do certain things, then I'm in good graces with God. Uh, look, folks, we do certain things because we have the grace of God on our lives, not in order to get it. And so the path of legalism and their basic error is they add to the Word of God. And their emphasis is on rules and regulations and guidelines. They tend to be rigid, religiously rigid. They believe in the reformation of self-righteousness. They behave. Little to nothing is permissible. And uh, as Paul says, they count the grace of God as none effect. Paul said in Galatians 1.6, I marvel that you so soon are removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Legalism is a deadly error. It is another gospel. It is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We shared with you that it is a belief that you measure spirituality by a list of do's and don'ts. And it judges primarily, legalism judges primarily by outward appearance. Uh, if you look the part, you're okay. If you don't look the part, you're not okay. And it is a belief that I can become holy by obeying rules and guidelines and laws. Legalism does not make people more spiritual, but it creates more issues and problems within the body of Christ. Because people are judged by how they are viewed and how they look. Paul says it is another gospel. But you see, laws don't change people. How many know that the Ten Commandments was good and it was right? But it only dealt with outward conduct. It only restricted or attempted to restrict what a person did. Now, the Bible says the law was righteous and the law was good. You could sum up the whole Ten Commandments and the two commandments that Jesus gave. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It was good, but you see, the law only restricted or attempted to restrict outward behavior. The rules or the law did not deal with the heart. That's why when you look at the Old Testament, you will find every prophet from Samuel after Samuel to the end of the Old Testament said there's coming the day when God's going to write his law where? Your On your heart and in your heart. Yeah. Because the, the living for God has to be heart motivated, not outward motivated. But you had the, you had the Jews who, who 
who began to determine their relationship with God based on what they did and not on, not on their love or the grace of God. So Paul, <coughs> Paul says that it is another gospel. You see, laws do not change people. They only restrict outward behavior. See, grace, somebody says, well, we're not under the law. We're under grace as if grace is somehow weaker than the law. Actually, grace is much more demanding than the law. Amen. Because grace doesn't deal just with outward behavior. Grace deals with the inward heart. Mm -hmm. Where it all starts in the first place. But how many know, if you know that you can do and not be? You can do things and not be that. Uh, so it's not in the doing, it's in the being. One of the things I try to drive home with our discipleship class is that God's more interested in what you are and what you are becoming than anything else. Because if I'm becoming more and more like Christ, then, I, then Christianity will flow from me because that's what I am. But, I don't, uh, but we don't want to fall into the trap of legalism that says if I do certain things, then I'm more righteous or I'm more spiritual or I'm more holy. There's none of those things that make a person holy. They should be a product of your relationship with Jesus Christ, not in order to have one or to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Paul, in writing to the Galatians, he says that uh, you know the flesh loves to be religious. Look at all the religions in the world. Look at all the denominations, even under Christianity. The flesh loves religion. Because it's a self-righteous attempt to be righteous before God on our own terms. And the fact of the matter is, is that we cannot be righteous before God except God impute his, impute his righteousness to us. Some of you will remember, and I'll get into this a little bit later a little more, but you will remember I said there's a difference in what God has imputed to us and what God imparts to us. God imputes righteousness to us. What does that mean? It just means God declares us righteous when we're not. Yeah. But then his grace imparts righteousness. What does that mean? It goes back to those two terms I've been trying to drill home. What I have legally and what I have experientially in Christ. What is declared and what is experienced. See, but holiness is imparted. It's something that I gain Little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, as I grow in the knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So holiness is imparted by a, a pursuit of God to become more and more like him. So those are the things that we're talking about. See, legalism is a fig leaf approach to, uh, to salvation, where we cover our own selves by our own attempts. And I will tell you, there's a lot of that out there in religion. In fact, all, all, almost all, all religions outside of Christianity is a legalistic form of uh, religion. Because you have to, the person has to do something in order to be saved. They have to uh, do their penance. They have to do whatever it is, you know, three times a day, set my face to Becca, or, you know, whatever it is. We have to discipline our lives and all. And some of those disciplines are good disciplines as far as just morality and good, good, good living. But none of that saves a person. You know, the reason why you and I are going to cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus Christ when we see him is because all the glory and all the honor belong to him. There's not one thing that I've done to merit anything from God. There is none good, no, not one. All have come short of the glory of God. All have missed the mark. Amen. And there's nothing that you and I can do to ever hit that mark. Right. Either before Christ or after Christ. There's, did you hear what I said? There's nothing that you and I can do. Because the work of grace is just that. It is the work of God's spirit and his grace in our lives to bring about the changes that need to be in our lives so that we become more and more like him. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. You know, uh, legalism is, a, is generally a lot of list of standards and guidelines and rules that restrict conduct and actions and behavior. 
And uh, it's an attempt to make ourselves worthy uh, of, of God. I, I, I shared with you last week, I just want to, I, I want to read this again because I, I think what Chuck, Chuck Colson has hit the mark in. His book, Loving God, he writes, Seeing holiness as rule-keeping breeds serious problems. First, it limits the scope of true biblical holiness, which must affect every aspect of our lives. Second, even though the rules may be biblically based, we often end up obeying rules rather than obeying God. Concern with the letter of the law can cause us to lose its spirit. Third, emphasis on rule keeping deludes us into thinking we can be holy through our own efforts, but there can be no holiness apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, for it is the grace that, that calls us to even want to be holy. And finally, our pious efforts can become ego gratifying, as if holy living were some sort of spiritual beauty contest. Such self-centered spirituality in turn leads to self-righteousness, the very opposite of selflessness of true holiness. You see, rule keeping can never be inclusive enough. I could give you the list of do's and don'ts, but you know what? Anything on the do list or the permitted list can become a god by virtue of emphasis. Nothing, nothing wrong with hunting unless you did it every Sunday. Nothing wrong with fishing unless you did it. Nothing wrong with golfing unless you did it every Sunday. And you miss church, or you weren't involved in the kingdom of God. Then it becomes a problem, doesn't it? Amen. Yeah, but it's on the do list. It's on the okay list. So what? And I'm going to share with you the difference because Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews tells us, we'll get to this later, when we talk about walking in liberty and love. He says, you know, you lay aside every sin and the weights and the sin that does so easily beset us. Some things are weights. Some things are out and out sin. And you need to know the difference between the two, but both of them are dangerous in the Christian life. So we need, we need to think about that. I want to share with you defining our terms, because I think this is important before I go any further in this uh, aspect of legalism. A lot of times when we, when we approach the scriptures and, and we, look at, we look at different things, if we don't define our terms, then it becomes left up to... Uh, uh, you know, innuendo and personal interpretation. If you're going to have a discussion about something, you've got to say, okay, this word means X. This means, it means something. This, this, this concept means this. Now we can have a basis of discussion about whether something is, is good or bad or different or whatever it is. So it dawned on me a number of years ago that we, we use terms in our movement and, and, and we're holding this movement. Uh, and we believe in holiness. I believe in holiness. I believe in godliness. I believe in righteousness. But I, I think one of the issues is that we did not define our terms, and so consequently we, we, we fell into putting words together and concepts together that weren't really scriptural. One of those was this holiness standard. There is no such thing as a holiness standard. There's no standard that in and of itself is holy. I know that may surprise somebody. But let's define our term. What is a standard? A standard is a fixed rule or measure that's established by authority. A standard is a fixed rule or measure that's established by authority. And if you look at the definition, a standard generally has to do with outward conduct. So when you talk about a standard, now is there any rule is there any rule or measure that can make anybody holy? No. There's no, there's no standard in and of itself that can produce holiness in a person. So when we use the term holiness standard, that's, the, that, that's not a biblical term. It's not a biblical concept. In fact, just the opposite is true. We'll get into the Judaizers, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees had all these standards. But Jesus said, none of those standards may make you, you don't even, you know, you don't even love God. So on outward, he says, you appear outwardly righteous unto whom? Unto men. But inwardly, 
You're full of dead men's bones. You're white at sepulchers, your graveyards. So there's no fixed rule in and of itself that can translate into holiness. Okay? It's a fixed rule. Number two, I, 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 I put this word down, conviction. Now I'm going to give you the definition of conviction and then I'm going to define a personal conviction. Okay? A conviction is a strong belief or persuasion that something is right <coughs> right or wrong based on evidence. Now think about that just for a moment. A conviction is a strong belief of the mind and it affects the mind. So standards affect outward conduct. Conviction affects the mind. Keep that in mind. Strong belief or persuasion that something is right or wrong based on evidence. So it affects your mind. Now people can have um, people can have uh, um, uh, what we call personal convictions. And uh, uh, those kind of fall into, I think, two, two categories, that are, at least in my mind, they fall into two categories. One is that they do definitely have, as, as they have examined the evidence in their minds, they have a strong belief that this is either right or wrong for them. And then there's a secondary that comes under personal convictions, and they're really not convictions, they're more preferences, strong preferences. People prefer to do certain things. Paul said uh, concerning uh, a conviction in Romans 14 and 5, he said, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So convictions affect the mind. affect the mind. And he says, if you have a conviction, then look at verse 20, uh, 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So he's saying here, here's a person that has a personal conviction about eating meat. Now to Paul, he said meat being sacrificed to idols and cooked has nothing, because he says an idol is nothing to me. But if my weaker brother have an issue with that, I won't eat meat in front of him so long as the world stands. Because he has a personal conviction. He's looked at the scripture. He's looked at, uh, he's, he's talked to God about it. He's prayed about it. And he's come to a persuasion in his mind that eating meat sacrificed to an idol is wrong for him. And the word of God says that it is wrong for him because that's a matter of faith for him. It's a matter of faith in his mind. So he has a conviction. Paul did not have the same conviction. But he goes on to say that if you, if you see somebody else who does something, but you have a conviction that if you violate your conviction, you're doing so against your own faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin to that person. So he can't, a person has personal, you know, some convictions about themselves, look at somebody else, cannot judge them. And Paul, in this whole passage, we'll get into that later. But he says, you can't judge somebody else who does, and I won't judge you if you do. Right. Or you don't. Now I'm not gonna. I have a responsibility. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna live such a life and say I'm free to do whatever I want to, and, and you know you just have to take it. But we have a responsibility to our weaker brothers and sisters, because he calls him a weaker brother. But it was an issue of faith, and Paul lays that down. That for him, this is a conviction. And he has to go because he has, he has been fully persuaded in his mind. So if he violates that conviction, then he is violating his own faith. 
Not to Paul. It was no big deal to him. So you see the difference? A standard is, some, is a fixed rule or measure that's given by authority. A conviction is something that happens on a personal level where somebody is fully persuaded. Now, the second part of that is that sometimes people just have preferences and they'll call them convictions. They're not really convictions. It's not a life or death matter. It's not a matter of their faith. It's a matter of their preference and they feel strongly about their preference. The problem with both of those standards and convictions, if I can't drive a red truck, then neither can you. That's the problem. I, if, I, if, if I have a conviction against putt-putt golf, then you better not either. I've had people over the years in my ministry come to me and tell me that they had personal convictions. I say, now, that, that's fine. That's not the position of the church here. But I will support you in your conviction to God. I will fully support you. It's not the position of the church, but I will personally support you in your stand. It's not the general teaching of this church, but I will support you. And I have shared that. Sometimes people who thought they had convictions about certain things come to a different understanding down the road about stuff. I, I, I'm going I'm to say this. You know, Brother, Brother Carney came to, uh, came into, Brother and Sister Carney came into the church in their mid-30s. And... Um, this was all new to them. They'd been in church, I think, five or six years, maybe uh, six years before he was asked to be the pastor of this church. And uh, he pastored the church. And when you're a part of a movement, you look around, you see what other people are doing, see what they're not doing, and you follow on. But I will tell you that over the years, Brother and Sister Carney's thinking changed about a number of things. And I think that's true not only of them, it's true of all of us. Some things that we as a movement looked at years ago that we thought, well, you shouldn't go there, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't be involved in that. We have changed our position on many of those things. In our particular movement, we have, we have statements that we are against worldly music, both, but we don't define what that is. There's no standard of what defines a worldly music. But I think a good spirit-filled Christian can know what kind of music they ought to be listening to and what they shouldn't. Okay, we talk about worldly amusements. We have a position on worldly amusements, but we do not define what those worldly amusements are. There is no standard of what worldly amusements are or entertainment. I mean, you know, it, 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 was always, it was always a little puzzle to me that you couldn't go to a, a baseball game at the ballpark, but you could go to Cedar Point. It just was inconsistent. Now here, let me share some things with you. So, uh, and for someone who's lived all across this nation and have traveled all across this nation and observed in many hundreds and hundreds of churches in my lifetime, where we were, and my dad, you know, was in the Navy, so we travel around. What, what one area believed you should and could and could not do was different than another area who said you could and could not do which is for, different from another area that you could or could not do. I told you, you know, I was from the South. We thought everybody above the mason Jason line was going to hell anyway. <laughs> all those Yankees were all, you know, all, all going to hell because they just were not home. And um, you think I'm kidding. I'm not. Because you guys wore short sleeves, and we didn't. So, what I'm saying is that different parts of the country and different areas in different parts of the country, 
you know, had, had, uh, had different what we call standards. The problem was, in my view, was not the fact that we had standards in different parts of the country and different churches, is that we did what a legalist does, and they make them commandments of God. <coughs> and we called it holiness. That, I think, was the issue and the problem that we faced. Uh, and people would take personal <coughs> convictions, and if I couldn't eat meat sacrificed aisles, then nobody else can. And Paul says, well, in front of him, I'm, going, I'm, I'm not going to eat meat. But to me, an idol is absolutely nothing. So I can eat that meat. It's not, not a problem to me. But see, the weaker brother would look at Paul as being unholy because he violated his conviction about something. So again, we have to define our terms. A standard is a fixed rule of measure actually given out by an authority. A conviction is a strong belief or persuasion in your mind that something is either right or wrong based on evidence. Holiness is a work of the Holy Ghost in the life of the believer to conform him to the image of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. How many want to be like Christ? Amen. Well, if you are pursuing holiness, you are pursuing the image of Jesus Christ. You're wanting to become like him. And your desire and your motivation is to please him in every area of your life. Amen. Amen? Amen. So I'm not free to do my thing. I'm only free to do God's thing. So I want you to keep that in mind. And I know, look, I know that in, in, a, in a subject like this, in talking about there's all kinds of questions and stuff, and hopefully I will get to it at least in principle. And people can take maybe an isolated lesson like this and pull it out and, and think I'm saying something that I'm not really saying or misinterpret it. I, I understand that this is not an easy thing to talk about. But let me give you some other definitions. You know, the Bible, we talked about being separate from the world, separation. But in many respects, over the years, until the last 25, 30 years, we didn't live a separated life from the world. We, live in, we lived an isolated life yep. right. from the world. Yep. And the Lord said, be you separate. You're in the world, but you're what? No. Not of it. <clears throat> but so many Christians, we lived, and I remember growing up in a lot of churches where we basically isolated ourselves from our community, uh, from from our neighbors, um, I, I've known folks who could said, uh, you know, I, I I can't stand there and talk to that guy while he's smoking. Yeah, just against my belief, as if his smoke, cigarette smoke, was going to make him unholy. <laughs> Get on him. Oh, well, there's been many times I've I've walked up to people <laughs> that were smoking. They knew as a preacher. I had one guy. <laughs> he had cigarettes, and he didn't bother me. I never condemned anybody for anything along that line. So, but when he saw me coming, he had a cigarette in his hand, so he tuck, it was cold, and he tucked it underneath his coat. His coat was oh. Oh. So, you know, I stood there just long enough. I, I was trying to be sensitive about it, because smoke was coming out of his jacket here, <laughs> and not, not embarrass him. But it, it was not, you, you know, but look, I have taught Bible studies with people puffing on a cigarette, and have a can of beer in one hand and the TV on, and I've got the Bible chart out here, and I'm teaching. <laughs> That's a challenge, folks, I tell you. That. But you see, Jesus said, I did not, and again, I wanted to put down a couple words, condemnation versus conviction. Condemnation and conviction, both, under both, you feel bad. But if you're around somebody who is condemning you, you want to get away from them as quickly as possible, be it an individual or a church. Because you feel the heavy breath of judgmentalism on you. 
So, but conviction, you feel bad for your sins, but the difference is that condemnation drives you away from Christ. But conviction draws you to Christ. You feel bad for your sins. I call it the white knuckle crowd. You ever seen them? Yes. They grab the pew in front of them and so tight under conviction that their knuckles turn white. <laughs> to keep from being drawn to the, to the power, by the power of God to the altar. See, there's a difference. Condemnation drives you away. Because it beats you over the head in judgment. And Jesus said, I didn't come to what? I didn't come to condemn the world. Because condemnation, being from an individual or a church, drives people away from God. True biblical conviction draws them to him. Because he's the remedy for whatever ails them. Does this make sense to you tonight? You see, here's, here's the thing. We, we have to look at the, at the, at the motivation. Um... I want to uh, uh, I want to read to you something here over the next few moments, and we'll, we'll, we'll quit. And, and you have to keep coming so that you get a good balance of what what I'm trying to say here about legalism, liberalism, and then walking in liberty and love. And I wish more of our church family would take advantage of this because I think it would clear up in their mind what it is that God is after in our lives. He doesn't want us just to live by a set of rules. He wants us to, he wants us to have a vital relationship with him. Right. And if I have a vital living relationship with him, then I'm going it's going to affect every area of my life. Uh, here, here is uh, someone wrote a day in the life of, of, of a legalist by Jack Stewart. Now again, you have to keep in mind how a legalist thinks. Uh, and I want to remind you that morality is not holiness. Being moral is not being spiritual. Because there are people in this world that from, a, from, from you know, even good standards, they are moral people. And they may not even know Christ at all. So morality is not spirituality. And conservative standards is not holiness. Otherwise, the Muslims would be holy. But they're not. How can they be if they don't know Christ? So having conservative lifestyle in and of itself does not make a person holy. But if you're holy, you will live a conservative lifestyle. That's the difference. So it's a difference in motivation. It's a difference in what you think it will do for you. A day in the life of a legalist is filled with trying to become and never arriving. He seems not to know that Christ means the end of the struggle for righteousness by the law. For everyone who believes in him, so he fights bravely and hopelessly on. Dwelling in a perpetual winterland of barrenness where the cold blast of condemnation and despair chill his soul. He rarely sees the sunlight of God's love and acceptance. Clouds of doubt and fear overcast the father's face whom he imagines to be more critical than compassionate, frowning than forgiving. A legalist day is usually joyless, lifeless, drab, and bound. He is a slave to rules, what to eat, drink, where, and where or where not to go. His life is nearly unbearable. Vainly thinking that doing, doing will achieve being, he forgets that God says, be ye holy. Holy living flows out of holy being. But evidently he does not understand, so he strains and struggles to lay hold of a righteousness that is forever beyond his reach. Bible reading, praying, giving, and witnessing are usually looked upon as obligations rather than joyous opportunities for the building and exercising of his faith. The pharisaical straitjacket he wears fails to make him holy, makes him look like he, he is, and deprives him of the joy of true holiness. A day in the life of a legalist, well, it is usually bleak and troubled, self-righteous or arrogant. It depends on his stance. 
mean or miserable, oppressive or oppressed. He cannot rejoice in the right. <coughs> Hold on. I lost my page. <coughs> Where'd you go? Hold on. I may have to tell you the rest of it later. Thanks, <laughs> I lost my page. Hmm. Hold on. Well, I'll have to finish it next week. You'll just have to come back next week. Well, let me conclude by, by saying this. Traveling the country and being in a lot of different churches in my lifetime, gr growing up in an atmosphere where everybody was judged by how they look, and by different things. I, and I, I told you, you know, in California, we, you know, there were things out there that was just mind-boggling to me. You go to different churches and you go to different places and, you know, one church will permit this, another church won't. And unfortunately, I saw a lot of division in the body of Christ simply because if that church didn't look like this church, we can't fellowship with you because you are unholy. And unfortunately, we still have a lot of that among us. In churches today. So, I remember preaching. I remember preaching for brother uh, brother Gambling, who was one of the pioneers of the gospel and one of the premier preachers on uh, on the oneness of the Godhead. And uh, he pastored in in uh, uh, Orange Orange Texas, down in the uh, oil uh, uh, refinery area. And I was a young evangelist, and when I evangelized, I never got into anybody's personal life. I was there to preach the gospel and bring people to Christ, and that's what I did. I never talked about any guidelines or standards or anything like that. It wasn't my place nor my business. I figured if the pastor was there all the time, if he can't handle it, my, my two weeks wasn't going to make any difference at all. Although it can, it can, it can be detrimental. We preached for this. I read and preached for Brother Gambling. And uh, unfortunately, he had an evangelist a couple of years prior to that come in. And that night, and the church was uh, didn't have any problem with wearing uh, wedding bands and things along that line. And unfortunately, this evangelist got up and he preached against rings. Any kind of ring. Didn't matter. And he divided that church. Now, you can't tell me that's holy. Right. Because God's not the author of confusion. Right. So when I came along and preached for him, you had the ringers on one side <laughs> and the non-ringers on the other side. I, I, I kid you not. <clears throat> and it was just so, so unfortunate to see that. A good church destroyed by somebody's foolishness yeah. and claiming that that was God's word. Mm. You know, the Bible is clear about these things. I will tell you, we'll get into some of this, but obviously there's some things that are cultural, that change. You know, a hundred years ago, if a woman showed her ankle, she was being immodest. Mm -hmm. It's true. So some things are cultural that change with the culture. Now, the issue of modesty never changes. Right? The principle of modesty never changes. But cultural dress does over a period of time. I mean, you know, a couple thousand years ago, we all wore robes. I mean, the guys wore robes. So there, there is those kind of... But, but the principle of righteousness and godliness... <coughs> What, what was, what's been tragic for me to see over the years, and I had to work through it myself because I, I grew up in this context 
where everything was judged by what you saw. If they looked the part, then we believe they were the part. But we all know that you can look the part and not be the part. We all know that you can look a certain way and be full of dead men's bones. I look at the history of my own religious experiences in churches and the people who did the most damage to the body of Christ claim to be the most holy. How unfortunate is that? So when I traveled around and you saw different uh, churches have different standards, that was okay. That, that's not a problem. I, I don't see any problem with that, with that. The problem is when we call our standards holiness, and if you didn't match my standard, uh, you're, not holy. you're not holy, and I cannot fellowship with you. That's the problem. It's when you take the traditions of man and make them the commandments of God, then that becomes a problem. And unfortunately, we still do some of that today. Amen. And uh, I, had to, I had to work through it. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm a product of how I was raised. And I will tell you, it took me a while to kind of sort through this because I didn't want to be all wrong before the Lord. But it, it, it appeared to me very early in, in, in my walk in relationship with God that that can't be the answer either. Judging somebody's spirituality based on how they looked or what they wore or whether they did this or that. I told you, I, 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 I'll close with this. I used to wear my hair uh, when I was at uh, in teenager. I, I used to comb this this back. It was the style of that. I'd comb this back and this over and this back. All right. So I wore that for a while, and then when I went to college, uh, Washington Baptist University, we were required to take ROTC, and we had to wear those caps. Well, that style of hair, when I put that cap on, when I took it off, it just went everywhere. So I said, I'm going to change the style of my hair, and it's pretty much what I wear, wear today. <laughs> That's how old it is. <laughs> so I put a part in my hair, which I didn't have, used to have a part. I put a part in my hair, and I combed it down like this because I could put that hat on. And then after marching for a couple of hours of ROTC, I could take the hat off and not look right. like that. <laughs> you would have thought. Now, this is Friendship, Arkansas. You would have thought. That me changing my hairstyle, I had committed the unpardonable sin. I kid you not. I got hammered from the pastor all the way down. And everybody in that church, just because I changed my hairstyle. <coughs> you see, that's what happens with legalism. It starts partialing it down. <coughs> Here, you're holy. Here, you're going to hell. Hello? Amen. If my hair doesn't touch my ears, <coughs> I'm holy. If I got side white sidewalls, I'm holy. <laughs> but if my hair touches my ears, I'm not. When I evangelized, I wore a, a foursome. It was a dress kind of boot. It was just a slightly high top, a high top shoe, and they were popular in style. But they had a, they had a, you know, they had a heel on it, but like that. Boy, did I get criticized for wearing a heel that was probably a quarter of an inch higher than normal. You see what can happen when you fall into the trap of legalism. <clears throat> And you know what I, you know how I know about legalism? Yeah, I've been one. I've judged people on what they wore, how they looked. I mean, we weren't allowed to, to we weren't allowed to listen to any music that wasn't Christian. I really sinned because the first 8-track I bought was, they didn't have Christian music on 8-track. 
Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But the first the first date track I bought was Glenn Campbell. <laughs> and I felt convicted by it. Because <laughs> we weren't allowed. We weren't allowed to do anything that was fun. We weren't allowed to go anywhere. We weren't allowed to do anything. In my small community in Friendship, the high school, they didn't have anything but basketball. And the basketball games of the high school in that area was the social event of the whole community. It was the social event. It's what... Where everybody went. Except me. Out of my classroom. Because I wasn't allowed. You see what can happen? You know what? What happens is that you can't make enough rules. I could share some really horror stories with you about churches who were so legalistic that you, it was abusive. Mm -hmm. That's the only kind word I can say about it. <clears throat> it was strictly abusive. Mm -hmm. And to micromanage people's lives. I will tell you, God never called me to micromanage your life. And I refuse to do that. If you want to know what God wants you to do, how he wants you to act, and how he wants you to live, you get into this word, and you pray, and God will direct your path. The same God that saved you is the same God that could direct your path. Amen. But God didn't call me as a pastor to micromanage anybody's life. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your mercy and your grace most of all. We thank you, Lord, for...